Today I'm continuing on with the reading of Thomas Arst's essay in Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Condition, edited by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst. Part 2. Even though the term postmodernity is difficult to define and contains a high degree of ambiguity due to its notorious lack of conceptual clarity, Attempts at diagnostic analysis have shown several general characteristics, such as deconstructionism, radical plurality, arbitrariness, liquidity, fragmentation, decanonization, acceleration, muddling through, increase in complexity, ambiguity, and slippery slopes. In a few sentences, German writer Hans Magnus Enzensberger masterfully portrays our contemporary postmodern condition, in which the increase in entropy can even be witnessed in our own backyards. Quote, Lower Bavarian market towns, rural villages in the Eiffel, small towns in Holstein, are populating themselves with figures that nobody would have considered imaginable just 30 years ago. Golf playing butchers, wives imported from Thailand, undercover intelligence officers in allotment gardens, Turkish mullahs, female pharmacists in Nicaragua committees, Mercedes-Benz driving vagabonds, anti-authoritarians with organic gardens, gun collecting tax officers, farmers breeding peacocks, militant lesbians, Tamil ice cream vendors, classical philologists trading commodity futures, mercenaries on home leave, extremist animal rights activists, cocaine dealers with tanning salons, dominatrices with customers from top management, computer freaks commuting between California databases and Hessian wildlife reserve parks, carpenters delivering doors made of gold to Saudi Arabia, art forgers, Carl May scholars, bodyguards, jazz experts, palliative care physicians, and porn producers. The loners and village idiots, weirdos and misfits, all have been replaced by the mediocre deviant, who does not even stick out anymore among the millions of his ilk. I suppose he could include lay Jungian readers in that group. In one important aspect, and this is the essential point with regard to Jung's Red Book, the diagnoses of our time appear to converge. There is, according to French philosopher and sociologist Jean-Francois Lyotard, himself a disappointed Marxist by his own admission, no major meaningful and integrative meta-narrative anymore. No grand narrative that is able to impart an all-encompassing conception of humankind's role in the world. For any grand narrative, such as is offered, for example, by the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Bible, the Odyssey, the Enlightenment, and belief in science or Marxism, the following postmodern analysis applies. Quote, simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodern as incredulity toward meta narratives. This incredulity is undoubtedly a product of progress in the sciences, but that progress in turn presupposes it. To the obsolescence of the meta narrative apparatus of legitimation corresponds, most notably, the crisis of metaphysical philosophy and of the university institution which in the past relied on it. The narrative function is losing its functors, its great hero, its great dangers, its great voyages, its great goal. It is being dispersed in clouds of narrative language. Narrative, but also denotative, prescriptive, descriptive, and so on. Conveyed within each cloud are pragmatic valencies specific to its kind. Each of us lives at the intersection of many of these. Unquote. 
From a spiritual point of view, the horizon of meaning offered by a divine order, the great order of being, is seemingly lost, while from the perspective of the postmodern subject, the world as well as life itself is not readable, understandable, or shapeable anymore. Whereas prior epics had a meaningful grand narrative, here Dante's Divine Comedy, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's Faust, and Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra come to mind. The modern or postmodern man is left without a timely, central, and vivid myth. In Edward Edinger's estimation, this condition of spiritual and metaphysical homelessness, a state of being perhaps best captured by Nietzsche's Last Man or Martin Heidegger's They, has only deepened in later times. Quote, it is evident to thoughtful people that Western society no longer has a viable functioning myth. Indeed, all major world cultures are approaching to a greater or lesser extent, the state of mythlessness. The breakdown of a central myth is like the shattering of a vessel containing a precious essence. Meaning is lost. Referring back to Jung's work, Edinger continues, as Jung's discovery of his own mythlessness paralleled the mythless condition of modern society, so Jung's discovery of his own individual myth will prove to be the first emergence of our new collective myth. Edinger's statement is only understandable if one puts aside the discourse of academic sociologists, cultural theorists, and professional philosophers, opening up to the sphere of individual core experience in the sense of Karl Fried, Graf, Durkheim or Jung's experience of the self, one approaches the psychological, religious, spiritual, and metaphysical realms of life that are generally thought to be off limits by today's postmodern academic establishment. Nothing causes greater tedium and disregards the central questions of our time more than the ignorance and prevailing bustle witnessed within the self-referential and detail-obsessed chairs of our university institutions. In all likelihood, nothing revelatory will come from their discourse. It might be this nearer universal bypassing of the central questions of our present age that is globally driving an increasing interest in Jung. The 21st century could be Jung's century, a century in which a postmodern state of mind and the demise of the secular conception of the human stimulates the intense search for sustainable alternatives to an epoch dominated by positivism, materialism, reductionism, and atheism. After all, in a spell of pneumophobia, modernity's enthronement of desiraison led to an oppression of all phenomena of the spirit or the sacred. Subsequently, the spirit, as well as the anima mundi, according to Nobel Prize winning physicist Wolfgang Pauli, has disappeared into consciousness. Jung described this process in The Spiritual Problem of Modern Man as follows, quote, whenever there exists some external form, be it an ideal or a ritual, by which all the yearnings and hopes of the soul are adequately expressed, as for instance in a living religion, then we may say that the psyche is outside and that there is no psychic problem, just as there is then no unconscious in our sense of the word. In consonance with this truth, the discovery of psychology falls entirely within the last decades although long before that man was introspective and intelligent enough to recognize the facts that are the subject matter of psychology. So also a spiritual need has produced in our time the discovery of psychology. The psychic facts still existed earlier, of course, but they did not attract attention, 
no one noticed them. People got along without them. But today we can no longer get along unless we pay attention to the psyche. Du seretir. Nonetheless, one has to follow God. According to the view of German writer Ernst Junger, Hence, the engagement with the unconscious becomes a vital necessity, not only for the individual, but for the social collective, since it has become a matter of survival. Ironically, the historic moment of the proclamation of the Iron Cage by sociologist and philosopher Max Weber coincided with the beginning of depth psychology, perhaps an unexpected cunning of reason. From the perspective of Jung's understanding of the evolution of human consciousness, the project of modernity could only lead to the darkening of the world. As Heidegger said, quote, For all ages before us have believed in gods in some form or other. Only an unparalleled impoverishment of symbolism could enable us to discover the gods as psychic factors, that is, as archetypes of the unconscious. Since the stars have fallen from heaven and our highest symbols have paled, a secret life holds sway in the unconscious. That is why we have a psychology today and why we speak of the unconscious. All this would be quite superfluous in an age or culture that possessed symbols. Symbols are spirit from above and under those conditions, the spirit is above too. Therefore, it would be a foolish and senseless undertaking for such people to wish to experience or investigate an unconscious that contains nothing but the silent, undisturbed sway of nature. Our unconscious, on the other hand, hides living water, spirit that has become nature, and that is why it is disturbed. Heaven has become for us the cosmic space of the physicists and the divine empyrean, a fair memory of things that once were. But the heart glows and a secret unrest gnaws at the roots of our being, unquote. 